Well, the Supreme Court heard argument in the last two weeks uh, during the first argument session in October um, can, on two death penalty cases which are perhaps mainly interesting because of how different the actual thicket of uh, legal rules that surround capital punishment is compared to what most people would imagine. They both involve very stark issues. One concerns a man who was essentially framed, convicted of a capital case that he did not commit. He spent 18 years in prison, 14 on death row, and is now attempting to use the federal courts to sue um, uh, uh, several years after his release uh, to obtain damages for the extraordinary ordeal to which he was subjected. The second case involves DNA testing. Uh, uh, a, Mr. Skinner, the petitioner in the second case in Skinner versus Switzer, was um, just a few hours away from being executed by the state of Texas when the U.S. Supreme Court granted a stay to consider his claim that Texas had violated the federal constitution by refusing to um, subject some blood found at the scene of the crime to DNA testing, which Skinner claimed uh, might have exonerated him. Now, both of these issues seem, when I describe it in those terms, to be pretty straightforward. Uh, but in this world, nothing is straightforward, and the court is grappling with extremely complex technical legal issues that will determine, in the first place, whether Mr. Thompson, the um, death row inmate in Louisiana, gets anything for all those years that he was wrongfully convicted and uh, condemned to death, or whether Mr. Switzer, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Skinner, um, the death row inmate in Texas, uh, gets to have a DNA test. In Connick versus Thompson, uh, a jury awarded um, the inmate, the former inmate, John Thompson, $14 million, a million dollars for every year that he spent on death row. The problem is, and the issue before the Supreme Court concerns the fact that it's long been uh, the rule that one cannot sue a prosecutor for anything that the prosecutor does in the course of a criminal trial. Uh, that is to say, prosecutors have absolute immunity from being sued in federal court. So um, the, the facts of the Thompson case, in, in a nutshell, were that a prosecutor in um, Orleans Parish in New Orleans, um, prior to Mr. Thompson's capital murder trial, um, tried him for a carjacking um, and suppressed, uh, hid the fact that blood um, tests taken from the scene, this is before DNA, but they did a blood typing, uh, and the blood tests showed that he could not have been um, the carjacker. It wasn't him. It, it had the wrong blood type. Um, that evidence was hidden for about 14 years until it finally came to light on the eve of Mr. Thompson's scheduled execution. That eventually led to both the carjacking conviction being overturned and the subsequent murder conviction because the cases in various ways had become intertwined. And when Mr. Thompson was retried on the murder, after more uh, um, favorable evidence had finally come to light, uh, years and years and years after his original trial, the jury acquitted him in just 35 minutes. Um, the problem is that when he brought a, uh, Louisiana limits uh, recovery uh, under state law to $150,000 maximum. It doesn't matter what the state has done to you. And the state, Louisiana, fought Thompson for um, four years before giving up that small amount of money. So Thompson brought a claim in federal court. The problem is that he couldn't sue the prosecutor because there's a rule that says you're not allowed to do that. That's to keep people from plaguing prosecutors with frivolous lawsuits. But here's a situation where a man had a lawsuit that was anything but frivolous. So he sued the office um, that employed these prosecutors, the DA himself and his whole office, um, alleging and in the end convincing a jury that the entire office had a policy of being cavalier and irresponsible in the way that, that, that it handled um, the obligation to turn over favorable evidence to defendants in criminal cases. A jury agreed with that. 
um, and found that by failing to train and inform the prosecutors of what the Constitution requires, the DA's office itself uh, was liable and was responsible for violating Mr. Thompson's rights. That has been, uh, the Supreme Court accepted the case to review that. Uh, and there's some reason to think, having um, listened to the oral argument uh, last week, that the court, by perhaps a five to four vote, is going to say that uh, Mr. Thompson failed to show that the failure to train, the failure to educate the prosecutors on what their obligations were, um, cannot be said to have actually caused the prosecutor to frame him. Um, and having failed to make that factual connection, he would get nothing and the $14 million verdict would be set aside and John Thompson would just be left um, with no remedy at all uh, in the federal court. So, uh, there's no way to tell what the, um, what the court will do, but uh, what we can say for certain is that the road to recovery for someone who has suffered the most extraordinary, outrageous constitutional wrong is much more winding and twisting than I think members of the public would ever imagine. In the second case, argued uh, on October 13th, um, Henry Skinner was uh, uh, about to be executed when um, his, uh, as I say, the, the Supreme Court granted a last minute stay. The court had already ruled um, last year in a case out of Alaska that there is no constitutional right for state inmates to have DNA testing. Uh, after they've been convicted, uh, that that is a matter that the states um, are in charge of. And if they have a procedure for that, fine. And if they don't, uh, that doesn't violate the Constitution. Well, Texas does have a procedure for um, uh, allowing inmates to seek DNA testing of evidence after they've been convicted. And Skinner tried to use it and ran into a rule in Texas which said that if you could have asked for DNA testing at the time of your trial and you didn't, you are absolutely barred and we aren't going to listen to any excuses or explanation for why you didn't ask for it, or more correctly, why your court-appointed lawyer didn't ask for it, uh, which Skinner's court-appointed lawyer did not. Skinner then sued in federal court um, saying that, uh, that that Texas rule is so rigid and so arbitrary that it actually violates the federal constitution. Um, and now the question is whether he is allowed to sue, uh, in, uh, to bring a civil lawsuit under the Civil Rights Act, which is what he has uh, done, or whether this is close enough to an attack on his underlying conviction that he should have been required to file a petition for habeas corpus. Now that sounds like a lot of uh, legal technicality, and it is, but the difference is, the reason why it's so important is that habeas corpus has now been federal, the law uh, governing federal habeas corpus petitions has been so restricted and so cut back on that Mr. Skinner can't file an application for habeas corpus. He's already filed one, raising other issues uh, in the years prior to his execution date being set. He was not successful at that, and the basic rule is that, in, uh, that except under the narrowest um, circumstances, uh, which he cannot establish here, uh, Mr. Skinner cannot file a second petition. So if the Supreme Court were to rule that he had used the wrong legal vehicle, um, that he should have brought a second habeas petition rather than um, suing under the Civil Rights uh, Statute, Section 1983, uh, the result will be that he's out of court and, has, uh, and will be executed without the state of Texas ever analyzing the DNA. Now, Texas says that this really isn't that big a deal because he's obviously guilty and the DNA results, if the uh, evidence was tested, probably wouldn't, or they say certainly wouldn't show um, that he was innocent. But the obvious rejoinder that, uh, that Skinner and his supporters make is that, well, if that's true, why not test it? It's simple to test DNA now. It's not expensive. It can be done quickly. What are they going to do if he's executed? Destroy the DNA or allow it to be tested then? He's not asking for Texas to pay for the testing. Uh, his attorneys are willing to pay for it themselves. Um, it, um, the, nevertheless, Texas is standing on its rights to regulate who gets DNA testing um, when they say that if you uh, had a rule that anyone who wanted DNA testing of all the evidence uh, 
uh, had a, it w simply got it um, done by asking for it, um, the crime labs would be swamped and death row inmates would be able to delay their executions and so on and so forth. The Texas has a good system for uh, regulating this and keeping it from getting out of hand and that Skinner was just on the losing side of their procedures and that should be the end of it. Uh, how the court is um, going to come out on this is hard to say. They've generally said that if a, if a lawsuit doesn't directly lead uh, to um, the issue of the, f the defendant's release, in other words, if a successful lawsuit wouldn't immediately necessarily require that his conviction or sentence be set aside, uh, that, that he's entitled uh, to bring it as a civil lawsuit under the Civil Rights Act uh, and is not required to go through the much more difficult procedures of federal habeas corpus. Um, whether they'll adhere to that rule here, if they do, Mr. Skinner will probably win and it will at least have his day in court uh, to um, show if he can that Texas's denial of his right to DNA testing was unconstitutional. If, on the other hand, they say this is too close to an attack on his conviction because, after all, if he got the DNA testing done and it helped him, he would you know, then um, clearly bring a, a new action to, um, uh, to set aside his conviction, that it's close enough to an attack on his conviction that we're going to treat it as though it was an attack on his conviction. And if that's what it is, he has to bring it in federal habeas. And as I say, be partly because he doesn't yet have the evidence and can't say what the evidence uh, would show or doesn't have the testing, um, he can't f fit through the tiny eye of the needle to allow him to bring a second habeas petition, so he's out of court without the DNA and without a hearing. And uh, how the court will come down on that is um, uh, very difficult to say.